All right, hey guys, welcome to uh, this week's Contra review. Um, we'll just wait a couple more minutes before we get started. And then yeah, we'll get started. Uh, we'll get started in like a minute. Let me just go grab some water. All right. Thanks. Uh, huh. Great. Thanks for your patience. I can get started for the chemistry section. All right. So I don't know if you can see that. All right, so welcome to week, I forget, week five maybe, I think at this point. And this is uh, MCAT chemistry. So this is the chemistry week. We go over chemistry concepts today and tomorrow, and then um, we'll do the other office hours this week. Um, yeah, so you guys had a good time so far. This will be the last unit I'm teaching um, for this. And then I think, you have one more unit after this. Good. Jump right in. Uh, quick overview of the uh, chemistry section. It's not just the chemistry section on the MCAT. You guys probably know by now it's chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. So this basically means chemistry and physics. But it, again, also, um, I can do about some biology on it, like biochemistry on it as well. So. Um, this is a contact breakthrough. So you have your first semester of biochemistry. That's 25%. So it's a pretty hefty amount. Uh, introductory biology is 5%. You have your general chemistry, which is 30%. Organic chemistry, which is 15%. And introductory physics, which is 25%. So these all make up this chem phys section of the MCAT. You also have a periodic table for the section. And this is also the first section when you take, take the exam. So as you can see, it's a pretty wide range of the chemical and biological and physics disciplines. Um, so you can, it can be a lot of stuff. It can be so much, it can be an overlap from your like biology and biochem section as well. It's also applicable here. All right, that being said, to the topic. So these are some of the topics that are covered in this chem phase sections, uh, uh, especially chemistry. So this is all the chemistry topics that are covered in the MCAT. So you should know atoms and periodic trends. We'll talk a little bit about that after. Bond interactions. 
molecules and stoichiometry, thermal chemistry, chemical equilibrium and kinetics, acids and bases. We we're also talking about solutions and gases, oxidation and reduction reactions, and electrochemistry. This is all the chemistry topics. Um, again, like it's not like super like in depth or anything. So, for example, thermal chemistry, you don't really go um, beyond like the ideal gas equations and like gives free energy and stuff like that. But other than that, um, there's still a little bit about each, and um, having knowledge in each of these disciplines is important. Having some basic fundamental knowledge is important. Okay. The more general tips, um, it's applicable, not just the chemistry section of MCAT, but um, all the sections. Um, try not to memorize concepts. Uh, try, try to memorize concepts rather than memorize like facts and individual details. So don't really just kind of think, get things in, um, just memorize, just room memorization. And that's applicable to some parts of it, but a lot of stuff like under, under like, you're saying the basic concepts, um, like how, Acid and basis work, or how uh, reactions work with a nucleophile, with an electrophile, that's all a lot more important than actually um, memorizing specific details. Because when it comes to MCAT, it's very likely that you probably won't even know what the passage is talking about. Like, you probably won't know what the concept is. You probably haven't heard about it before. So, it's going to be a new concept, new uh, passage where you don't have that much background information on. Again, then spend time reviewing all questions, especially the ones you get wrong. Um, so, it's very important, like, one day you take the um, practice exam, for example, the next day you should probably spend the whole entire day reviewing the practice exam and really going over every question, every answer tracing, why does this make sense? And if you don't know something, um, you got to review the information, review the content again, um, and so you don't make the same mistake again. So, um, and especially Khan Academy is really useful if you have any like, specific questions, or specific content you want to review, and get uh, questions for answers, it can be, oh, that's also a great resource and they can have specific questions tailored to the specific topics that you're interested in. And when it comes to naming and identifying compounds, use the prefix and suffixes of each name. So you guys probably see in your um, time or as you start practicing, um, a lot of times they'll have like a nomenclature question in the MCAT, especially in this section. So there will be like a nomenclature like, What's the name of this compound? What's and a lot of times it's important to just know your prefix and suffixes. It can help. So the right is like a little table, you know. Um, if you get the or you get the carboxylic acid. Um, and the O A is ester, amide, al, um, ketones are own. Um, they can also be the prefix like oxo, keto. Uh, hydroxy is always important to alcohol. Um, and you know the like ene, uh, ane, and that's like the alkanes, alkynes, alkenes are single bond, triple bond, double bond. Um, and yeah, so these are all really important. And also knowing, I guess, the carbons, like naming carbon, carbons, like uh, meth, F, uh, ter, butane, so like how many carbons are each, and find the, um, like where to start the ca counting in a uh, hydrocarbon chain. Um, that's important as well. So these are the basic nomenclature is also really important. And um, knowing your previous suffixes can help when it comes to a uh, compound that you probably don't even know. Um, yeah, go okay. up. Next, we're talking about periodic trends. So these are just the uh, basic periodic trends. I don't think you need to know any other periodic trends besides these for the uh, MCAT. So ionization energy, you can just go one by one. So ionization energy in the top right here is basically the amount of energy, at least when you remove an electron, or how, how much energy needed to remove an electron. So it increases from the right, and as you go up, this makes sense. For example, the noble gases have the highest ionization energies because they're noble gases, they have a filled octet. So removing and so stabilizing, a filled octet stabilizes those noble, noble gases on the right, right here. And having and removing electron from them takes a lot of energy It takes because uh, they're very stable. Um, and the opposite from like the very left, so like this um, sodium, for example, uh, Removing electrons it has a low ionization energy because moving an electron is favorable because it come, becomes a noble gas and it gets that configuration, electron configuration. Um, so that's important. Electron negativity is basically how um, much an atom wants an electron or, or has electron affinity for, or yeah, so it's, in other words, how much the um, atom wants an electron. So, example, that also increases the same trend. So, it goes right and goes up. So, for example, fluorine 
oxygen, nitrogen, those are all very highly electronegative atoms. And that's kind of the basis of a hydrogen bond, which I'll talk about, but those are very highly electronegative. That means they want electrons and they keep electrons to themselves. Um, and this can it increases as you go right in a row because you increase the number of protons and the atoms. So if you go from this row to, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but let me know if you can. If you go right in a row, you increase the number of protons in the nucleus and thus you increase the nuclear effective charge that attracts electrons and hold electrons more closely. So example, fluorine has more protons than like sodium. And so it holds, um, has a more effect nuclear charge and it can hold electrons closer and ha thus has a higher electronegativity. Electron affinity, um, it's kind of follows a similar trend, but it's basically uh, the amount of energy released when you um, remove an electron. So, or like how much, if you think about how much, think of it as how much an atom wants to gain an electron, basically. Um, is a good way of thinking about it. Again, the ones on the right, like fluorine, uh, would like to gain an electron because it becomes a noble gas. And that's more stable. It has a stable and filled octet. So it's the eight to the electrons. Um, you can think about it as a Lewis dot structure. Atomic radius is important. So that's a different trend. So it goes down and it goes left. So that's big. How much, what's the atomic radius? How big an atom really is. Um, if an atom has more shells, like as you go bottom, it has more uh, shells or more like the quantum number n increases. So it's like n equals five down here. Um, so they're bigger. So they have more, their valence shells are farther away. They have more electrons, they have more protons. It's a bigger atom. And as you go left the uh, in a row, the atomic radius also increases because that means they, again, they have a smaller effective nuclear charge because there's less protons they're holding electrons close to the area. So if the effective nuclear charge is smaller, that means the electrons won't be held as closely because the positive nuclear attracts a negative electron. And if it's smaller, if the effective nuclear charge is smaller and there's protons in it, and it won't attract electrons or pull the electrons as closely to the nucleus, increasing the atomic radius. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, let me know if it doesn't. And then metallic character, non-metallic character, we'll talk about this about, uh, We'll talk about what that means uh, in a bit, um, but yeah, it increases um, diagonal, diagonally. So um, yeah, and you should know the different parts of the periodic table as well. Noble gases, um, the halogens are right here, the transition metals, alkali earth metals, and the alkali metal. All right. But yeah, if you have any questions, feel really to type in the chat or just say them um, as well. All right, types of bonds. It's important as you're very basic, ionic, covalent, hydrogen, and metallic bond. So ionic bond, again, uh, metal atom loses electrons to a non-metal atom. So it can become sodium chloride. The ionic bond when you just transfer electrons fully. It's no electron sharing here. Uh, chlorine is a lot more electronegative than the sodium, as we talked about. Chlorine just takes all the electrons, uh, electron, um, takes all the, uh, takes the electron from, from sodium and becomes Cl minus and sodium, Na plus. And those, are both a very strong bond. Same thing with magnesium oxide. Oxygen oxygen is a lot more electronegative than magnesium. So it takes um, the electrons from magnesium fully, not sharing electrons, and becoming an ionic bond. Covalent bond is when atoms share electrons. So they, they can have nonpolar and polar, meaning if they share electrons equally, it's nonpolar, but if they don't share equally, it's polar. For example, two oxygen atoms are same in electronegativity. So um, they will share electrons equally. Uh, water, for example, oxygen is a lot more electronegative again than hydrogen. So it will actually pull the electrons from the hydrogen a little closer. So getting a partial negative charge while hydrogens have a partial positive charge. And again, a hydrogen bond is a just different type of a stronger covalent bond, strongest. Um, and so it's between a hydrogen and either oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. Um, nitrogen, so it's really three um, very electronegative atoms. In this case, it's between the, the oxygen has again it has a negative partial negative charge, and hydrogen has a partial positive charge. They have this um, attraction. It's not it's not a covalent bond. They don't share electrons. It's more of this um, <clears throat> interaction, which is 
um, very, very strong. And then you have your metallic bond, uh, which is positive metal ions attract electrons. So it's just uh, a sea of kind of ions, positively charged, and a sea of like electron cloud. You probably see that you see those in metals, conducting metals. And okay. Then intermolecular forces. Again, the um, hydrogen bond is the strongest intermolecular force. It's not equivalent bonds. These are these do not share electrons. They're just a for um, intermolecular forces, forces between different atoms. Hydrogen bond is the strongest. And like I said, it's a polar hydrogen um, and it has a very great dipole. Um, you have your ion dipole. This is an um, ion with another dipole charge. So like sodium plus is an ion. And water has that dipole too. It's like it can also form these, um, these intermolecular um, uh, forces, or intermolecular kind of bonding. And then dipole dipole is probably one that's between two dipole charges. So Cl minus and I. So if you can see here, it gives you ICL as an example. So Cl has a partial negative charge here. It's very electronegative, and the um, I or the iodine has a partial positive charge. This is not as electronegative, and that positive, um, and the partial negative attracts that partial positive and forms a dipole dipole direction. You have your iron induced dipole, where the iron actually induces a dipole in a molecule that does not, would not normally have a dipole. In this case, you gets you iron 2. So Fe2 plus induces a dipole on the O2 and O2 again is non-polar, so it does not have a dipole usually, but in the presence of an ion, it can actually the electron cloud can switch. So as you can see here, electron cloud um, is actually pushed a little bit um, due to this positive charge. It's pushed away from one of the oxygens and it can induce a dipole. You also have your dipole induced dipole, which again <laughs> it's an interesting name, but um, again, a dip a molecule that has a dipole like HCl can induce a dipole. A molecule that does not normally have one again, Cl2 in this case, and the partial negative in the um, partial negative in the HCl in the Cl and the HCl bond uh, can induce a dipole on the Cl and push its electrons away, um, giving a, a, a partial positive charge. Again, another famous one is the London dispersion forces um, or the Van der Waal forces, and this is um, a polarizable electron clouds or a um, kind of interaction that is happening to a chance um, between two uh, molecules that do not usually have dipoles, in this case, F2 and F2. They don't have dipoles, but as you know, electrons don't really stay in one place. They move around. And at any greater point when they move around and it's like a cloud, certain amount of electrons can be in a greater area um, at a specific time, and that can induce a dipole. It can just be a very short temporary dipole, but it can just induce a dipole in the, in the molecule. And it, force and interaction. Um, these, are, these are very weak, the weakest in the intermolecular forces. Um, and every atom has this. It can, it's it's going to uh, happen in every um, molecule, every atom. Every atom has electrons and molecules. Okay. Any questions so far? OK. Um, okay, amino acids. Um, there's also tests in this section, so it's important that you know your amino acids very well at this point um, in the summer. So you should know them very well, memorize them, know all the structures for them, the three letter, na the na their names, the three letter abbreviations, the one letter codes, everything should should be like, um, it should be super easy. It should be, uh, you should know this, and out like you can recite it in your sleep basically at this point and test it in all on this section and also in the biology biochem section so it's very important um yeah and you can see here yeah super super important okay all right so now we're gonna move into something a little different this is the um hard soft acid base three hsab um it is um, somewhat test. It is something that MCAT can come up, but I decided to go over it. Um, I decided to go over it today um, because I don't know. Sometimes it's most people don't really know uh, this theory or don't have a good grasp on this theory because you probably don't you don't really learn it in like intro chem. 
Um, so I can go over it today and can come up and it has um, applications in um, all different parts of chemistry. So it's uh, very applicable and the fundamental basis about this theory is applicable to all chemistry and, and uses very important concepts like polar polarizability and everything like that, which is very important. Okay, so going into it. Um, acid and bases can be hard or soft. You know, again, it's not like physically hard or soft. It's a term we use. Um, and hard usually means the acid um, or base is small and non-polarizable and soft is the opposite. Soft, so meaning if an atom is small and it's non-polarizable, polarizable, um, you basically think of as, so right here, polarizability is a tendency of electron cloud to be distorted from its normal shape. So if an electron cloud is big, if you have a big electron cloud, a big atom, it's easier to be just distorted from its normal shape. So if you go back to what, um, well, back to this section, so the atom is big, it can actually distort the electron cloud of other atoms. So it, like, you can see this is what distorting electron cloud is. It's like a, I can move the tendency, like the electron cloud here, I can move. So some of the negative charge can go on one side and some of the positive charge can go on the other side. So that's kind of point of liability. Um, can it be a larger atom is more likely to be ion induced. So like if an ion comes, it can be more likely polarizable electron cloud can shift in terms um, of another, some other species coming in. So if you, um, for example, if you put like a big atom in front of like so Na plus or something, electron cloud can be distorted more, if that makes sense. And that's what polarizability is. And soft is basically the opposite. So it's um, soft acid and basically usually larger and they're more polarizable. They have a big electron cloud that can be distorted. So these are some basic characteristics of hard acid and bases. Um, they have small atomic radii, as I said, low polarizability, high a positive charge. So, uh, so yeah, so it can have a high positive charge. So like plus three, plus two, very high. Um, high electron activities, electron activity, electronegativity, sorry, um, for a base, um, high charge density. I mean, the charge density, the charge um, of the atom is concentrated, it's closer. High oxidation they should say, so they all basically mean the same thing. If you have a high oxidation state, you have a high positive charge. Um, so they're very basically all saying the same thing. It's um, small in size, and the, the electron cloud is small. And it has a high charge density. The charge is very localized. And what's really important is that hard goes with hard and soft goes with soft. So hard acids go with hard bases and soft acids go with soft bases. Uh, and that's basically a hard goes with hard and soft goes with soft. So it's important to you can predict what happens in a chemical reaction. If you add two things in solution, you can predict what happens by knowing that hard goes with hard and soft goes with soft. And down here is the basic um, outline of it. So you have your acids, your bases. These are generally hard acid bases. So again, you can see the small atoms that have high charges and that are low, low polarizability. So aluminum three plus, chromium three plus, potassium three plus, OH minus, ammonia, Fluorine minus fluorine. And you have your a SOP on the other side, so your copper plus, uh, palladium two plus, SCN minus, RS, iodide minus. These are all soft ones, are all a lot bigger. As you can see they're, they're further down in the periodic table. So, again, that's where periodic trends come back into play. So, they're further down the periodic table, so they're a little bigger. Um, they also have um, not as charged. Um, bigger atoms also have a bigger electron cloud, so not very more polarizable. Um, and yeah, as you can see, even in SCN, if you draw a structure for SCN minus, um, it also has resonance in it. That means the, and by having resonance, it can also mean that the um, negative charge is also distributed across the whole atom. So uh, again, it's more distributed. It's not, the charge is not as localized, so it's softer. So that's also something you can think of. And then the borderline ones are in the middle. So it's kind of on the border of hard and soft. All right, any questions from there? Okay. Now, we do some practice. Um, so give you guys a couple to uh, think about this um, and go over the slides. So that hard asset and base theory can be used to predict solubility trends based on 
the determination of the hardness of the ions, what happens when A, G, F, and L, I, A, and lithium iodide are placed together in solution? So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to think over this. Um, I'll go back to the slide, which kind of talks about it a little more. And yeah, let me know when you guys are done. And I'll check in, in like five minutes or so. But yeah, here's the thing slide, and here's the question. All right, we're gonna be able to, to work on this. Any more time? All right, most part done. Pop thumbs up on if you're done. Well, I can give you a couple more minutes.
Okay, I need more time. I worked on this. Uh, I'll give you a couple more minutes then. And this is the, it's a, a song to help. All right, you can go over it now. The question you guys all got a chance to look at it is hopefully, um, yeah, you can go look at it. So, if uh, if AGF or and let's say either patient institution, what happens? So, first part is definitely looking this uh, looking at these different ions. So, these are all ion, ions. So, it's so AG plus and F minus, and this is Li plus and I minus, and we know that hard goes with hard and soft goes with soft. Um, and we can see that AG plus is definitely a lot bigger. If I add on the lithium, I can even pull up a periodic table to show you guys. Um, it can be a little easier. So the ions are AG plus right here. Very cool. So ions are AG plus, so lithium plus is right here. It's up top and it's the left. And F minus is right here. And AG is a lot lower, AG silver, so it's right all the way down here. A lot lower than Li or F. And then we know the other ion was 
what? Iodine. Iodine is a lot lower than F minus as well. So we go down here. So we know that the, the trend for you know, the hard acid or base is a smaller acid or base and it's less polarizable. So that means F is going to be a lot smaller than I because the you know, trend for uh, atomic radius um, goes down to the left. So, and as we're going up to the right, that means atomic radius actually decreases because we're having less um, valence shells. So it's going to be a lot smaller and also the charge is going to be more concentrated. So it does have a um, lower, uh, um, be less polarizable than I. So it's going to be, it's going to be a harder base than I minus. So for in, the four nine is going to be um, F minus is harder than I minus. Then we got lithium Li plus and Ag plus. Uh, lithium again is um, a lot higher up in the periodic table than Ag plus, so it does have it can be smaller. They both also only have a positive charge, so lithium being smaller and having a, a plus one charge, just like Ag, definitely make it a lot harder of an acid. So Li plus is harder than Ag plus. Uh, just because, as you know, it's going to be smaller and it's going to be less polarizable if as the trend for atomic radius goes down and to the left from what we looked at earlier, uh, I talked about earlier. So that's why hard goes to the hard. That means ideally lithium would go with chlorine and Ag plus would go with I minus. Okay. So if we go back to the question right here, the answer would then be what? A, only AGI precipitates initially, but as well as back in the solution, A, AG plus forms uh, complex with F minus and water. Only F, LIF precipitates or both LIF and AGI precipitates. So as we said from the periodic table, LI plus and F minus are both hard. So they're gonna, um, hard goes with hard, so they're gonna go together. So they're gonna, and, Ag plus and I minus are both soft, and soft goes to soft, so they'll go together. So again, the right answer is C. Both LIF and AGI precipitate because they'll once in solution they'll all be separate ions. So it'll be Ag plus F minus Li plus and I minus. And then they'll associate um, to LIF and AGI once in solution and precipitate out. All right, does that make sense? Any any questions regarding that? All right, if not, we go to the next question, which I guess is also correlated to the periodic trend, so it's a great unit to go over. What does the following tend to have a negative correlation with hardness? And again, definition of hardness is, um, well, you can, look at, you can look at this right here, what a hard acid base is, but really a hard one is gonna be a smaller acid or base, it's gonna be less polarizable. Um, so, we have a negative correlation with hardness. So it shouldn't be too tricky, but I'll give you guys a couple minutes to look over it. And yeah, let me know if you have any questions or are done.
All right, we guys do I need more time. We will work through this. All right, thank you. So, some thumbs up. All right, so what's the following trend has a negative correlation with hardness? So that means a negative correlation against the inverse. So it's so if hardness increases, then this will decrease. Um, I think that's the answer is um, probably polarizability. Well, that's said a lot of times right now. Um, it's polarizability is the right answer A. So as something becomes harder, it becomes less and less polarizable. That's very true. Um, electronegativity negativity doesn't really work that way. Um, oxidation state, you know, if you increase oxidation states, you, go, you can go back to this. If we increase the act, um, oxidation state, we're increasing the positive charge. It's gonna be more hard. Electronegativity um, for a base will be more hard. So F minus is a lot better. It's more like negative. So it's a lot, it's a um, harder base than iodine minus, for example, which we just went over. So, and so that's electronegativity. So it'll be positive correlation, not negative. Charge density is also, uh, as we said right here, a higher charge density meaning that there's more, the charge is more localized, uh, it's less polarizable and thus more hard. The right answer is polarizability. Uh, one more for you guys here. This was a little more um, tricky. Uh, probably the last one we're gonna do today, but it's a little more tricky, uh, but it really also brings back other contents that you should need to know how uh, nomenclature works, because uh, like, MCAT will just give you this, but you'll need to know um, how nomenclature works, bring back some of the organic chemistry knowledge about electrophiles, and then use this hard, new hard acid based stuff that you just learned to answer this question. So it's a very multi step process and a multi step question. Okay, so recent clinical trials have suggested that 1 3 dicarbonyl enolates offer cytoprotective effects against toxicants of a similar softness or hardness. Your research, team, your research team has identified methyl vinyl ketone butanone as a soft electrophile and 2,5-hexane dione as a hard electrophile. Again, so which of the following, if any, will curcumin offer the best protection? So as you can see, um, it's really important to try it first, I guess my tip is draw all this stuff out and kind of see what like what's one three carbon elite look like? What does cur curcumin look like? What does T five hexadione look like? And then um go from there. So I'll give you guys a probably give you a decent amount of time to work on this one and then let me know if you guys are done, if you have any questions as well.
All right, we built uh work through this a few more time. It's good to, to go over this. If you guys don't, does someone have a have an answer? Oh they say. Okay, I can give you guys a couple more minutes to work on it. No one looks like they're done yet. I actually think what I'll do is you guys can probably just work on it for the rest of the, because it's already like 7.54, so you guys can just work on it for the rest, a um, couple more minutes, and then we can just go over it tomorrow. And you guys can work on it. I'm going to scroll the answer then. So I'm not sure. I don't think anyone's done yet. So Give you guys like a couple more minutes, and then if you can still... Don't feel rushed, you can just work on it after, and then we'll go over the answer and go over the question tomorrow. That sounds good. What? Yes. Okay, I guess we can just end a little early and then, yeah, you guys can just keep working on this. Um, you guys aren't done yet. And then you can take a screenshot of this to keep working on it. And then we'll come back here tomorrow. I think same time to look um, and to go over this question and some other stuff. Uh, Boston chemistry content. Uh, we're going over like NMR, IR and all that stuff tomorrow. So we're going to come and then I uh, will also have like office hours and study sessions throughout the rest of the week. Um, with that, thanks for coming. And yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any more questions on any of the stuff I covered today, and then we'll go over it quickly tomorrow.